a very very interesting subject and i'm sure you know this subject uh, which pertains to india us relationship has drawn the attention of all the stakeholders in the country it is it is a, a national uh, person as to how we navigate this relationship we have had no certain experiences in the past uh, but the current uh, changes in the geopolitical domain the emergence of regional conflicts our uh, dependence of uh, defense imports from russia uh, getting under lot of uh, stress uh, the india us partnership assumes you know, much more greater importance as compared to the earlier times and i must say at the uh, open stage itself that even usa despite certain apprehensions on some of our quarters has been accommodative to a large extent in some counts like we imported yes 400 from russia but the katsa sanction was not imposed on us we have been importing oil from russia despite the embargo but again there is no uh, negative impact on india and so many other things which are happening in fact which uh, iran we signed the chabar agreement for the next 10 years again there was uh, no negative impact and at least that is what has been put so far uh, we could not have been luckier uh, today uh, to touch this subject as against you know general uh, ahuja who has also been my mentor and if i have learned something if at all you know he has got a major contribution uh, towards that so sir grateful to you and now i will request uh, arizita the lead coordinator to uh, introduce you to the audience and thereafter we will request you to dwell on this thank you sir i would like to take this opportunity to introduce our speaker for today lieutenant general uh, anil ahuja pvsm uism avsm sm bsm and part is the former deputy chief of integrated defense staff for policy planning and force development he has commanded a corps and a division in eastern command along the northern borders he was the co-founding uh, chair of uh, india us defense technology and trade initiative inter agency task force and has been the secretary of the defense acquisition council during the period uh, 2014 to 2016 he has also been in india's defense attache to vietnam cambodia laos and un military observer in angola post retirement he has been a senior fellow for defense policy at the delhi policy group member of executive council of usi and is presently a distinguished fellow at the vivekanand international foundation over to you now sir alios uh th thank you general ashok and uh, arjita for uh, this introduction and uh, at the outset let me thank uh, the dg for giving me an opportunity to interact with you all on this topic which he has already highlighted the contemporary relevance of it i look forward to an invigorating discussion well as for the planning i have about 35 to 40 minutes available to speak on this vast subject of a uh, trajectory of india us defense and security partnership perhaps the most consequential strategic partnership that we have today and which has very varied dimensions and very varied dimensions accompanied by very varied views and opinions amongst all of us so for optimal utilization of time i'll skip out some factual aspects like the kick lighter proposals india us civil nuclear deal etc which are either well known or are directly available on the net and my endeavor would be one to focus on the defense relationship aspect since it's been uh, the central pillar of our relationship and also touch upon certain aspects or certain misconceptions that exist outside and maybe some background which may not be available to you in uh, the open domain so i'll try and focus on that and what i what i've done is 
very broadly i propose to cover the stock in uh, five parts at the outset i wish to contextualize this relationship why us relationship is significant for us in india and why india relationship is significant for the us thereafter i'll cover some of the drivers of our relationship which i'll just try and summarize very briefly we'll very quickly run through the progressive evolution over the last two and a half decades amplifying and giving background to certain key developments thereafter i'll come to a certain perception many of our or many of us would have heard we are saying we are entering a new era of relationship with us now i'll try and touch on this are we entering a new era if we are entering a new era what is that new era and finally how do we visualize the relationship going ahead so uh and thereafter whatever is left out i'll be happy to cover during the q and a session so let's quickly jump on to the first part that is contextualizing the relationship now today we speak so effusively of the comprehensive global strategic partnership between india and us a very grand nomenclature that has been given and we call it the most consequential relationship of the 21st century with all this happening just in a matter of two decades plus two two and a half decades and this during this period we have moved very very rapidly from what i call a state of estrangement which is generally the period before 90s and the period of engagement that is late 90s 2000 onwards and most you know most such things cannot be given on exact date line but most people relate the turning point to bill clinton's visit in 2000 but i am talking of the area generally of 90s and the beginning of the century now while our leaders are talking of having overcome the hesitation of history there are underlying differences which are playing out and some of these playing out in public domain every day now let me just touch a few of these we have our respective perspective on engagement with global south then there's india's advocacy of multipolarity contrary to the americans thrust for a us led global order we have amongst us issues over trade threats of sanctions over katsa or some or the other secondary issues uh, secondary sanctions issues that keep coming up occasionally differences over relations with russia over the war in ukraine issues related to human rights freedom of press minorities religious freedom and those related to likes of pandus and nijers and more there have been many of these differences many more will come up but then despite all this the relation keeps getting deeper and deeper so what drives this relationship so close my short answer is one geopolitical convergence and the second is acceptance of reality of mutual dependence and as we realize uh with our security environment now that india has come to be placed at the geographic front line of the indo pacific in this cold war 2.0 in this security environment india and us have a shared vision and shared concerns over the way the great power contestation is playing out between us and china in the indo pacific and between india and china along our land borders 
in the maritime domain in the Indian Ocean and in our neighborhood in South Asia. Now, China views this India-China confrontation as an extension or a subset of its contestation with the US. Now, the China, the challenge of uh, dealing with China have changed over the years. While in the late 80s, when we had Sundrongchu incident, incidentally, the Sundrongchu was in the area of responsibility of uh, your DG when he was a brigade commander. Now, while we dealt with them over Sundrongchu incident in 80s, in 90s, when we formulated the peace and tranquility agreements, the confidence building measures, 93, 96, you are aware of them. Now, since then, things have changed. They have drastically changed. Look at the parent. That time, our GDP and military power was nearly the same. But today, if I look at the statistics of April 24, that are available uh, on the net. China's GDP is 18.53 trillion dollars, whereas ours is about 3.73. This is about five times the differential. And besides the economic differential, we have a differential, a different system of governance, economic, I have already told you, and the way we are planning our growth, we have our differences. China has emerged as a manufacturing power and this revolution has made it indispensable to the global supply chains, including to India. We are dependent, we have a trade. I mean, that is the reality which we have to face today. Now, we, besides the economic differential, we have the differential of geopolitical heft, China being one of the P5. Then we have differential in technology between our two countries. But at the same time, we have to meet the China challenge. And in fact, what makes China challenge significant for India and the US, or in fact, the rest of the region or rest of the world is not its rapid economic military or industrial growth. But the challenges of the accompanied aggressive behavior that we are experiencing. Now, China has got it in its mind that US is a declining power. It relates this perception to the period 2008-2009 during the Great Depression when during Obama administration, strategic outreach was made to China and we all heard the talk of a possible G2 between these two countries. Now, this was perceived by China as a sign of US retreat then. And unfortunately, China perceives this happening again today. So, there are obvious efforts on part of China to displace the United States from this region and create an uncontested unipolar Sinocentric Asia. Now with this scenario prevailing, restraining the hegemonic behavior of China, whether on our borders or for the US power contestation, this is a shared challenge and a ground for our strategic convergence. Now, when we are in a situation like this, which you all appreciate, there are a couple of options of dealing with it. Now, I have thought of five options. Maybe uh, some of you can think of much more options. So, in my mind, the options available are, number one, seek membership of an alliance system. Number two, accept unequal status and reconcile with the powerful neighbor, relegating 
the settlement of border dispute to a later date, as the Chinese are insisting. And as in fact, what they are doing with Vietnam, which is in nearly the same position as us with shared land borders, but they have accepted settlement of boundary dispute at a later date. The third option available is issue-based regional partnerships and minilaterals. The fourth, hedge between powerful neighbor and between major his major adversaries. And the fifth option is forge a strategic partnership with major global powers with shared values, shared interests, as we are doing with US. And in this fifth option, let me reiterate, forge strategic partnership distinct from an alliance. They are different. Now, no option is exclusive. All have certain overlaps. And I'm sure you can make out which option are we using. But this has to, any of the options that you choose, has to be built on the fundamental foundation of developing our own capability. So in developing our relations with the US, what we are looking at is meeting the China challenge and alongside exploring options to build our own capability across domains and to meet our security needs. Now, in objective assessment, if we look at our differential, our differential is not so pronounced in conventional military force. The size of the force or the grit of the soldier, in fact, the grit of the Indian soldier is better than the PLA soldier. But we have problems differential in the strategic domain as well as in non-conventional domains like cyberspace, information, legal warfare, and in areas of ISR, maritime domain awareness, fields of critical and emerging technology. So while in India we are spending enough on building our capability, we are the largest importer of defense, we spend every year $80 billion plus on our defense to reasonably meet the China challenge, but this also calls for building strategic partnerships to be able to bridge this gap, at least in the medium term. Likewise, India with its military power and its huge economy is central to the implementation of US's Indo-Pacific strategy, which is bridging the gap with China. Now, uh, let me let me share with you something. We, I was a part of Delhi Policy Group some time back, and we had done a survey that time for a study on India-U.S. defense relations. To the questionnaire, that which of the two relationship would you prioritize for furthering and strengthening our own capabilities in future? 70% of the respondents had said US and only 30 had said Russia relationship. So for future, people looked at the relationship with US. But to another question, 55% respondents prioritized Russia over US in terms of reliability as a defense partner, which was based on a previous experience. And the priority areas for cooperation highlighted were ISR, maritime domain awareness, in sharing, naval systems, and space. Now, having given you this context, now let me summarize this into a few drivers that I visualize that what is driving India-US partnership. To my mind, from the US perspective, there are primarily three drivers. Number one, complement India's own efforts in developing its capabilities and capacities to emerge as a key alternative or a key counterweight to China in the Indo-Pacific. And within Indo-Pacific, particularly in the Indian Ocean region 
and in South Asia. And this contributes to the strategy of integrated defense of the US. The second driver is to harness India's very large pool of technically qualified and talented human resources. This is to revolutionize advancements in critical and emerging technologies to bridge gap with China in a telescope time frame and incorporate India in the resilient supply chains. Now, last year, beginning of last year, there was a US State Department funded study carried out which concluded that China has a lead over the US in 37 out of 44 technologies, including in the field of robotics and AI. And this is where the additional Indian brains and the additional Indian hands, they come in. And the third driver, to my mind, is to explore the immense potential of Indian market whether it is defense market or it is the civil commercial market, particularly in the fields of advanced technology like semiconductors, advanced telecommunication, space, nuclear, cyber, AI, high performance computing, biotechnology and much more. So these are the drivers and the primacy is of the geopolitical driver from US towards India. So look at, let's look at the drivers from the Indian perspective. From Indian perspective, our primary driver is to create economic, military, technological and overarching political and strategic convergence to enable us to build our own capabilities across multiple domains. So what primary driver for us is our desire to transform and modernize India to make it a prosperous and secure country. And US today is our partner of choice. It's our largest near our trade partner nearly there is a 0.1 billion dollar difference between number one China and number two USA this year 23-24 and it is the largest in the investor for us. So uh, this is what is driving us like I said the primacy of geopolitics from the American perspective the primacy of transforming and modernizing and building our capability from the Indian perspective. Now let me uh, just briefly touch that same survey that I was talking of. We had asked the participants in that survey that when you build defense capabilities, what are the priorities for you? Why are we developing relation with the US in defense and security? So prioritize what are your thought why we should be doing it. And the respondents listed their P1 was strengthening own capabilities across multiple domains because we'll have to fight ourselves. The second was mitigating China challenge. Third was getting defense technologies. Fourth was getting political heft by being friendly. And fifth was procuring sophisticated weapons. So there's a belated recognition between us of accepting mutual dependence and when you have mutual dependence you can behave with each other like co-equals or at least near co-equals and that is what is driving our relationship today. Now let's move on to the next part of progressive evolution of our relationship. I will very briefly recapitulate because some of these factuals are very well known to everyone. I'll just run through them. I have already alluded to the period of pre 90s and 2000 being a period of estrangement and thereafter beginning the period of engagement. Now, even within period of engagement, let's start from 2000. 
what is normally given in the literature, Bill Clinton's visit of 2000. So from there till today, I look at it, I mean, having been associated with watching US relations, India-US defense relations, I view it in two stages. Number one stage, to my mind, it's not been classified. I mean, I'll give you my logic for it. One was till the period of Trump administration, that is up to 2020. And stage two, which is little different, but the substance remains the same. That is during the Biden administration starting 21, 2021 till today. Now, the first stage uh, was generally characterized by defense and security relationship being the unquestioned central pillar of this relationship. Relationship was generally Pentagon-led and the focus was on putting building blocks of this relationship in place. The next stage is the period under Biden administration starting 21 and continuing till now. This relationship as against the Pentagon relationship has now been become State Department led relationship. Defense pillar, which was hitherto unquestioned central pillar. Now here, there's an attempt to broad base this relationship. In politeness, they said this is an overburdened pillar of relationship. In fact, what they meant is it is overemphasized pillar that we are laying too much of emphasis in. It has been diffused. It has gone to technology. It has gone to industry. I'll come to it a little later. Now, the foundation of defense relationship started getting laid in 1990s itself, post the collapse of Soviet Union. In 92, 93, uh, the service ex executive steering groups ESGs, we have Army, Navy, Air Force. They started getting constituted under three stars. 1995, we had Defense Planning Group under the Defense Secretary, Military Cooperation Group, Joint Technology Group. Malabar exercise got instituted as a bilateral exercise in 1992. And Japan and Australia have come in much later. Japan came in 2015, Australia came in 2020. So it started in 1992. That is the relationship when it started building, it was through military. And slowly and progressively, joint agreements started getting uh, signed. I mean, the first thing that is documented is as innocuous as the agreed minutes of defense relations of 1995. That time, even this was very significant. Now, Come to 2004, we decided to have a next step in strategic partnership that got initiated and cooperation was expanded to civilian, civil nuclear activity, civilian space program, high technology trade and uh, ISRO was removed from the entity list. It was decided that we will have a dialogue on missile defense. and. Slowly, as we, the progress took place in the civil nuclear deal, alongside we had new framework of defense cooperation in uh, 2005 for 10 years. It was renewed in 2015. It will be coming up for renewal again next year. So that laid out the vast scope of our uh, cooperation in defense. But the most intense period of activity was roughly between starting from 2014-15 to about 2020 or so, these five, six years. And uh, I'm, I'm not referring to any political dispensation. This government was in power or that government was in power. It's got, well, my statement has got nothing to do with it. It is related to the pace of our activity. And the way it was done, the effort was made from both sides. Now, 2016 or so, when Obama's second term was coming to an end, 
we had dedicated people on both sides. And even from American side, Secretary Ashton Carter, and some of them were making effort to develop deeper relationship. They decided on a major defense partner status for us. This, they said that we don't know who will come in the next elections, whether Trump will come or Hillary Clinton will come that time. So whatever progress has been made, let's institutionalize it. Put it under Title 10, put it under the National Defense Authorization Act. And this status was put in 2017. Thereafter, alongside, we had this logistic support agreement, uh, what we call LIBOA in 2016. Then we had uh, SISMO or COMCASA. Thereafter, we had BECA in 2020. Then we had this Industrial Security Annex. Now, this enables the private sector industry to share classified information and technology which could hitherto only be done with the government. So 2019 was the time when industry got enabled to get technology, uh, classified technology and classified information. From the US side, they put us in uh, strategic trade authorization, STA1 status. Now, for STA1 status, you have to be, you have to have signed to be a member of all the multilateral arms control agreements. You have MTCR, you have Australia Group, you have Vasanar Group, and NSG. Now, we had become members of three, but we are not members of NSG because China is obstructing it for political reasons. But despite that, we were elevated to STA1 allowing access to advanced technology, allowing export of controlled items under defined conditions without transaction specific license. 2014-15, we had Defense Technology and Trade Initiative. Uh, now, this idea had been initiated on the US side in 2012, but it got operationalized around September, October 2014. And the first meeting we had was in December 2015. Uh, this was to increase the flow of technology investments, enhancing cooperation, research, development. Now, there's been substantial criticism of uh, DTTI that oh, they didn't achieve anything. Let me tell you, uh, DTTI has been a silent enabler. Otherwise, the ISAT, in the first meeting of ISAT in January last year, when we started talking of aero engines in the first meeting itself, obviously it couldn't have happened in first meeting unless it was built on what happened during DTTI. So DTTI will not make headlines, but it has done some tangible achievements. It has brought together in one forum under senior level supervision, stakeholders from diverse ministries, R&D, uh, MEA, MOD, oh, people from industry, people from commerce, and everybody has come together. There were joint working groups. We learned to work with each other on aircraft carrier technology. My naval friends would appreciate it better. What is the level of cooperation or success we achieved in this? And most important, we learned how to work together. Now, something you must understand is we have ability to work around. This foundational agreements that you call, I remember sitting in the meetings and not even agreeing. Now, I look, uh, when I look back, perhaps I find it am amateurish on my part, perhaps, that we said, no, these are not foundational agreements. So we said, okay. Let's not call them foundational agreements. Let's call them enabling agreements. Now, LIMOA, we don't agree. Uh, sorry, LSA, logistic support agreement, we don't agree. Okay, let's call it LIMOA. Uh, same, likewise, we said COMCASA. Uh, now, this was a nomenclature crafted by us. To say that, okay, we are not replicating many of those things. We are doing it India-specific thing. So uh, this is how 
we have the ability to overcome challenges and in the larger domain you are aware of it we can discuss it little later then you come to acquisitions post 2008 primarily the acquisition started about 20 billion dollars worth you know what all we have uh, i mean you are all very well aware of 130 c17s the pashes chinooks uh, ultra light hobitzers p8is uh g404 g414 like uh, uh, engines uh, we are acquiring these uh, M, uh, mq9s and g414 etc etc so the question was initially we started buying buying to meet our operational needs then after we moved to assembly integration and testing facility like we did in case of ultra light hobitzer with mahindra setting up the ait facility now we are moving into mro we are moving into co uh, we are manufacturing and finally looking at going to co production co development so there's a method in the madness as to how we are progressing now number of plethora of exercises number of courses that we have we started malabar like i said in 92 yuddh abhyas the army exercise battalion level exercise we started about two decades back in 2002 our special forces started decade and a half vajra pahar we started doing in 2010 nsg tarakash we started doing it in 2015 air force in 2004 cop india tiger triumph a tri service exercise instituted in 2019 and since recent years we've been doing it with the central command with africa command also so uh things have deepened and rather than having our relationship only with the indo pacom now we have relationship with africa command we have with the central command we have a naval lo at bahrain and a us navy lo at gurugram information fusion center and of course the greatest emphasis of cooperation is in maritime domain we have agreement for real time exchange of information across all domains and we are doing it for domain awareness including underwater domain awareness now one of on this plethora of talks and dialogues that we have since 2018 we have the 2 plus 2 dialogue which is under the supervision of uh, minister of external affairs and rm and their counterparts on the other side so this is how we have progressed now let me come to this aspect that is it a new era of cooperation yes since biden's time uh, like i said it was state department led relationship the aim is to broad base it so what we started having was after the 2 plus 2 dialogue that we had in april 22 in washington uh india decided to join the combined maritime task force in the gulf as associate partner please note this we are not jumping in full heartedly we are calibrating our step now while associate partner is not defined particularly anywhere but to my understanding it is we are working in coordination coordinating our tasks sharing information coordinating our act activities without coming under command because this is a grouping of 34 nations it is led by this uh, task force in gulf is led by permanently by a us navy rear admiral so we are doing it in coordination without coming under command then the two sides have signed the master ship repair agreement initially it started off with lnt at kattupally then with mazagon docks and very recently with cochin three ships have been uh, repaired now again look at the nuanced thing the ships being repaired which have been repaired are us sea lift command they are part of us navy but these 125 odd ships 
are manned not by competent naval personnel, but these are people outside the uniform, which are for global logistic and global depart uh, global deployments of the U.S. Navy. So there's we are moving closer, but we are moving closer thoughtfully. Now there's much greater emphasis on cooperation in cyberspace. We started last year in May. We started the advanced domain defense dialogue in cyberspace. Then we have the defense industrial cooperation. Last year, June, Lloyd Austin was here, and we had a defense industrial roadmap, which has been laid out for uh, doing technology development together, for lifting licensing and other restrictive norms. So. Slowly, we have moved into technology. Slowly, we have moved into industry. Now, the most significant development, which is not strictly defense, is the ISAT. It was agreed between uh, Prime Minister and US President in May 22 in Tokyo, inaugural meeting uh, was uh, January last year. And the review meeting was just held very recently, 17th June uh, last month when uh, Jake Sullivan was here. We have done this meeting. So the scope today, like we say we are in multi-domain warfare, the scope has gone well beyond defense into dual-use technologies. And the level in DTTI, it was headed by Secretary of Defense Production. Now the level of interaction has gone to the National Security Advisors. And we have a vast scope, space, semiconductors, telecommunications, AI, quantum, biotechnology, critical materials, clean energy. And stakeholders have changed. It's government, it's industry, it is academia, it is the investors who are all coming into it. And impetus is for entrepreneurs. So what we have is we have innovation competitions. Uh, we have the Indus X. We have impact challenges under them. Then we have the IDEX challenges. The talent is picked up. Some are nurtured by the US arms majors. So they are getting encouragement to get their innovations monetized or to get into capability development. So with all this, let me come to the last bit of it, that how do we visualize the future? We moved a lot. We have a long way to go. There are certain issues where we have certain differences. There is a disparity in the priority of region. US's focus is on East Asia, on Southeast Asia. Ours, of course, is on Indian Ocean. And for them, they want us to have priority to capability development in maritime domain. Whereas for us, we have to balance between the continental and the maritime domain because we have our challenges in both. Now, US's approach towards China today is of cooperation, contestation and conflict. And what they can do at best is to give us an assurance. There is no commitment like to an ally. Now, we want to be circumspect. We want to be conscious. We have our apprehensions of becoming a frontline state in their rivalry without adequate guarantees. Then there are issues of perception of interoperability. Americans feel it's a function of having same equipment, same platforms. Whereas we feel that under given conditions that we have, consider our equipment profile, we feel that interoperability can be achieved by coordinating our communications, command and control, sorting out our drills and SOPs, and we can work together. Now here, there is a difference in our thinking, and we have apprehensions that we, when we connect on the communication link, perhaps they may become insecure, they may be founded, they may be ill-founded, but yes, apprehensions do exist. Then apprehensions with respect to Russia, issues related to our inventory, issues related to technology security. Uh, now, the biggest paradox is the priorities of our relationship. 
in terms of value india rates very high in the indo pacific in supporting us's indo pacific policy and integrated defense but in terms of hierarchy of trust or align or relationship as an ally we come down well below nato well below the european allies below five eyes i mean we come well down fourth or fifth in the pecking order so reconciling this remains a challenge between us american side talks more of co production whereas we want to look at more at co development indigenization is perceived by them as protectionism and uh, there is a difference in understanding between the obligations and commitment between partners and between allies so how do we move ahead number 1 keep expectations realistic while there is convergence of vision primacy would be of national interest there will be no altruism there will be cost to be paid there will be economic costs there will be strategic costs building blocks have been put in place many of the sweeteners that we had okay now trump is coming we'll sign a deal for mh60 romeo 24 helicopters we'll take from them or we'll take mq9 so we'll take something you know these were sweeteners now the building blocks have been put the sweeteners have by far dried down so we have to the challenge is of, of operationalizing within this distinct pyramid of trust now the challenge is not so much in government to government cooperation the challenge is between industry to industry cooperation because on indian side we have not been able to operationalize the strategic partnership model and selecting the right industry by the government to match with the other side is a challenge we have to be able to arrive at a full answer for it now technology transfer is very easily said but the challenges inherent in it are not appreciated it's not a revolution it cannot be given as an intravenous injection it takes time and the time of the magnitude of 10 years 15 years 20 years we fail to appreciate that next we talk of lowering barriers on both sides uh friends let's understand that whether it's arms control act or itar regulations or we have export administration regulations or on our side defense acquisition procedure they were framed as guardrails they were not framed as road blocks so to remove them we'll need a good strategic rationale so this relationship can only move further if we continue nurturing it we continue looking at exploring ways to overcome it and then we realize that there is given taken this relationship there is no altruism there are things which us has to understand there are things that we have to understand so i have finished whatever questions you may have i would try and answer